In this presentation, I will look at the problem of research writing from a structural point of view. Clearly, this is not the only point of view. There is also the audience, your own capabilities and your preferences to be taken into account. All of these and others are non-standard issues. You remember from our discussion of research criteria that research on the whole is a standardized activity in the sense that the criteria need to be fulfilled. And as long as you satisfy these basic research criteria, people will focus on your results. They will be free to discuss content rather than form. However, to further facilitate such a discussion focused on content, there are additional rules. These are not quite as important as principles, but they are just as widespread. Such a rule concerns the form in which research is traditionally, that is, at least since a few hundred years, presented. The acronym for this form is IMRAD. It stands for Introduction, Method, Results and Discussion. Even though not all publications have only these headlines, the four sections Introduction, Methods, Results and Discussion dominate every scientific publication. It is also the secret format of most dissertations and theses, in the sense that this is what academic readers will look for. All the other ingredients, such as various lists, references, illustrations, tables, are still important to have. They are critical, in fact, for the completion of your work, but IMRAD is where the soul of your research really sits. Why is that so? When I recently asked some students who are currently working on their master thesis, I received a number of good answers. First off, IMRAD does represent a logical flow. First you set up the scene, then you explain how you proceeded, then you say what you found out, and finally you settle the score by interpreting and by explaining what the results mean. IMRAD also helps with orientation, especially if I'm an expert reader, I might like to skip straight to the discussion. Or, if I am curious about ways to do research, I can focus on the method. By the same token, such a structure is used to check the validity and relevance of the research. It makes it easier to compare, which is particularly important when there is a lot of research and a lot of results, which is the case today in almost all areas of science. And lastly, it helps if you want to learn from those who did similar research before you, you might like to actually copy their approach. Then it is helpful not to have to look around a lot or to have to guess. Here's an example. If you wish to present your results at a conference, you are usually asked to submit an abstract. Now, as you can see on this slide, an abstract can and usually will contain exactly the aforementioned items. A very brief introduction, a little bit about the approach, the main results, and a short account of what it all means. In fact, practitioners and reviewers will use IMRAD to quickly get an idea of the quality of a given paper. As the editor of two scientific publications, I have to read a lot of papers. Those papers that are missing out on any of the four key issues are much less likely to make the mark. Now, let us discuss every one of these four building blocks of scientific publications in turn. At the end, we will look at the implications for your thesis. The introduction is like an introduction between people, in this case, the author and the reader. It's a handshake, a teaser with content and consequences. The introduction should set the scene in more ways than one. Of course, it should set the scene in terms of content. What's the topic? Why is it important? Why was it important to you to do anything about it? Storytelling, the ability to knit together key characters and plot, is important here. In another lecture, you will learn more about designing a logical introduction using the SCFA method by Barbara Minto, also called the Pyramid Principle. In the introduction, you also introduce your style and your way of expressing yourself. As a rule, you need to stay away from whimsical or colloquial expressions and maintain what is also called a scientific distance. This is another word for objectivity, one of the key criteria you already heard about. The introduction can include a literature review, 
though it is better to have a separate section for that, depending on the degree to which your thesis is a piece of applied research. As a rule, the more conceptual your research, the more literature and the more emphasis there is on the literature review. You should, of course, reference throughout and especially in the introduction not to succumb to a journalistic style of opinion making. Any and every claim you make has to be both validated and relevant. This is especially true for numbers. Any number you mention must be put in context. You can talk about your motivation as well. How much subjective and personal point of view is permissive or adequate will again depend on your topic and on your supervisor. Supervisors usually have strict views about point of view and not all share my approach, which is that any point of view is all right as long as it is justified. The most important part of the introduction by far is your description and possible explanation of the research question or questions and your possible hypothesis or hypotheses. You remember not, that not all research questions must be questions in the grammatical sense and that not all research questions must be matched by hypotheses. However, if you have a hypothesis or have a strong conviction, perhaps even in the context of existing theory, then you should mention it. To summarize, the introduction should say what your story is. It should mention who and what came before you with regards to your research and you should outline where you're going with this. Do I really have to say a lot about the importance of research methods? I think if by this time you're not convinced that research methods are superbly important for your thesis, then I may have to rethink my whole approach to the topic. Certainly in scientific publications and really also in your thesis, there should be a separate rich section outlining specifically what kind of re scientific research methods you used. If you tried or considered more than one method, you may also say this here. But the main emphasis should be on explaining your approach. No matter if you only read all available literature on the topic, or if you made an experiment, or if you wrote computer programs. An objective description of your method implies some information about the proper naming of your methods. You cannot do this without having looked in a methods publication and without having read and understood a few examples. In this description, as in all descriptions of your approach, you should mention anything related to the path on which you walked to get your results. Do not skip the obvious, but go beyond the obvious. Reason your method. Give arguments why you chose this and no other method or methods. The purpose of such a description, <clears throat> among others, such as justifying your approach, is to let those who come after you who will continue researching your topic, know how and why you did it. This may save them a lot of work. Ideally, in the literature that you read, you already found similar passages helping you pick a particular method. Questions to cover in this section include, how did you arrive at your method? Hopefully not just randomly or out of convenience. Why exactly did you pick this method or set of methods? How exactly did you proceed? And did the method work out? This section also requires you to say who contributed to your effort and participated in it. Research participants include survey subjects, case study companies, and so on. The next section, results, is often felt to be the most rewarding from the point of view of the author. Because this is where you can put all that you have found out on the table. The only requirements are that it is true, transparent, systematically presented and as complete as possible. How exactly you present your results will of course depend on your method and on your topic. If you choose graphs, tables, drawings or text. Anything that does not belong to the story of your research does not have to be here. The results should lead to the discussion. Survey questions detailed numerical evaluations and other materials that you used to arrive at your results can and should be put in the appendix. This is the place for anything that is required to fully understand your work, 
but not required to understand the story behind your work. In terms of story, the results section gives away all the information without hardly any of the interpretation and meaning. This is strange if you're used to fiction, but it is okay for science because the best part, the discussion, is still to come. Summarizing, the results section needs to contain your basic findings, as well as those things that you did not find out as long as you hoped you would. Participants and contributors to the results also need to be listed and mentioned here. You may ask what's the difference between mentioning participants here in the results and in the methods section. Let me give you an example. If you interviewed an expert as part of your research, then you must mention the fact that the interviews, your interviewees and your reason for interviewing them in the methods section. In the results section, you relate what it is they actually said, either in direct or in indirect form. In terms of scientific weight, the discussion section is the most important part of the whole paper. You say what your findings mean. Again, there are different ways to do this. If there is relevant literature on your topic, the assumption is that you found it and that you are now in a position to talk about your results in the light of that literature. For example, you might have found something that nobody has discussed before or something that other authors thought impossible and so on. If there is a theory, this is the place to talk about it. Not about the theory as such, that's something that you might have done in the introduction, but about the meaning of your results in terms of theory. Perhaps your results require an extension of existing theory, or perhaps the existing theory cannot explain what you have found out. This section can be written in many different styles and tones. As long as you're not bullshitting and say what you really think and really know, you can hardly make a mistake. As a subsection of the discussion, you should also discuss the limitations of your own approach. For example, due to the selection of the people you interviewed or the special position of the companies on which your case study is based. Limitations could be positioned in the methods section, but if you obtained surprising results or if your chosen approach did not yield the results you hoped it would, you should mention this here as well. Very likely you will not know all the limitations of your work. What the reviewer and the reader are looking for is an awareness of your limitations. Now, what does all this mean for your thesis? First off, Imrad is your slave and not your master. This scheme is supposed to help you identify weaknesses and position the different parts of your thinking and your work in the best possible light. This is why IMRAD has become a quasi-standard in the first place. A thesis, if only for formal reasons, has to have a lot more baggage than a scientific paper. Of course, you need a list of references, which needs to satisfy certain rules, including proper standardized citation. Of course, you need a section to conclude. All scientific papers have that as well. But in these conclusions, you only reiterate your most important findings, no more perhaps with a short outlook, though I think such an outlook is better positioned in the discussion. Having a solid grasp on the IMRAD structure will help you construct a solid story around your research. And no matter what you may have heard, a solid story is what any supervisor and any reader will be looking for. Put differently, if the story is strong, you get extra credits that you can waste on silly mistakes. But if your story is weak, or if there is no discernible story, you have got a big problem. So ask yourself the four questions. Did I get the introduction right? Do I know exactly what I did in terms of approach and method? Am I sure about the presentation of my results? And lastly, did I milk my results sufficiently using all resources at my disposal, including the available literature?